I uh, was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, raised here and uh, lived here until I was 17 years old, went away to college and eventually came back. My father was uh, Alvin Rubin. He was a lawyer in Baton Rouge. He practiced labor law and tax law and taught at the law school from 1946. He taught for 41 years at the law school as an adjunct. My mother was a poet, a Janice Rubin and was born in Ginsburg and uh, both of them met in Alexandria, Louisiana and moved to Baton Rouge. Uh, my father eventually became a judge on the U.S. Fifth Circuit. First he was in the district court in New Orleans and then in the U.S. Fifth Circuit. Well growing up in Baton Rouge was great in the 50s and 60s. Uh, had a small town atmosphere. Uh, I went to uh, the lab school, University Lab School on the LSU campus. At that time, most of the students were students who were uh, kids of faculty members. It was a small class. There were like 30 students in a class. Um, and uh, during the summers, uh, I picked figs and sold figs. Uh, I uh, worked in mowing yards. Uh, I worked uh, partly in construction. Uh, as, a, as a laborer, and I also uh, started at about 16 years old playing jazz professionally. My first professional gig was at the Jung Hotel in New Orleans. There was a bank uh, party in which Bob Pettit, who was at that time a famous basketball player, joined the bank, and they were giving a party, and they needed somebody to play piano, so I played piano. At Amherst College, my, uh, my major was English, uh, and I loved it. I thought it was great. You know, you could spend all this time and you could read great books, and, that, and you get grades for it. This was wonderful. And I also uh, took writing with a lady named Tilly Olson, who was a short story writer. And so I loved Amherst. It was, it's, a, uh, it's a college, it's a small college in the Berkshires. In college, I did, uh, had three jobs. Number one, I worked in the dining hall morning and evenings. I worked kitchen uh, in the dining hall in the morning and in the evenings as a, as a cleaner upper, as a busboy essentially. And then I also had a jazz band and I started playing jazz both individually and with my band and we ended up playing four nights a week by the senior year. Uh, I am married to uh, Ann Liss. We met uh, the first week of college at a mixer, and then we uh, didn't really date again until uh, February, and it was kind of love at first sight, and we were together ever since, and we married the week we graduated. Going into the law was kind of the last thing I wanted to do. My father was a lawyer, my grandfather was a lawyer, my father was a teacher. I said, I want to do anything other than law and teaching. And what I want to do is music. So I actually had gotten uh, a job for my band and for myself in New York. Uh, I actually had a job potentially writing jingles. But we decided that we would all go to grad school because maybe we need something to fall back on if this music business didn't work out and we would then come back together and the only one who kept up with music afterwards was me. Up on the East Coast there was all kinds of attractions of going to law school on the East Coast and I applied to a bunch and got into a bunch but my wife and I thought you know if I ever want to retire at some elderly age of 60 or more and we might want to come back to Louisiana and if we need to do that we need to know that weird Louisiana civil law and the best place we figured to do that was at LSU because that was the best school for civil law. My, my father taught there, why would I not go there? And I thought, I'll go there and then we'll leave. I promise we won't stay in Louisiana, we'll go somewhere else, we'll come back on the East Coast. And it didn't work out that way. So when I got to LSU, it was, it was refreshing. It was after Amherst where English was great and I loved the courses and I loved the reading, but every opinion counted and no opinion was better than the other. I loved the intellectual rigor of law school and I loved the reading. And I, uh, in fact, the reason I went to law school rather than some other graduate school is I had a course in legal theory at uh, Amherst and I just got involved and I thought this would be an interesting thing to do. So I, I got to law school and I really enjoyed it. And of course I was fortunate to be there when all the, the, the famous people who have written all the treatises were there. So Joe Dana and J. Denson Smith and uh, Professor Lazarus and Bob Pascal and Wex Malone and Dean Paul Hebert and 
Saul Lifanoff and Ianopoulos. I mean, they were all there, and they were all my teachers, and it was a, it was a fantastic experience to go through. I know some people didn't enjoy law school, but I thought it was great. When I got out of law school, uh, I wanted to teach. I thought that would be great. I, I love law school so much. So I went to Dean Paul Hebert, who was running the law school at the time. I said, I would love to teach. And he said, well, Mike, that's great. Love to have you teach. What course would you like? And I said, well, you know, I did really well in contracts. I'd like to teach contracts. He'd say, Mike, that's a wonderful idea. But, you know, that's a freshman course. And, and we don't let adjuncts teach. Fresh. What else? So I listed three or four other courses. And there was always a reason why that course wouldn't work. But he was, what else? It turned out finally there were only two courses available. One was workers' comp, and one was security devices, which is banking and, and finance and mortgage lending. And I said, well, I'll do the civil code course. Although uh, I had had Joe Dano, uh, I thought I could learn something more about that. And that's how I started teaching. Uh, I've also taught about 10 years at Southern and a couple of years at Tulane. So uh, I, I've enjoyed teaching at all those law schools. We had uh, opportunities here that we did not have elsewhere, and she uh, got a job that she could not have gotten elsewhere. So we decided we'd stay in Louisiana. So I joined uh, a firm called Sanders, Downing, Keene, and Castasu. And it was at that time one of the biggest law firms in the, in the city, and I was number 12. So I felt I was in this huge law firm. And my job was to do anything that the senior partners wanted. Every day there was a court run for a uh, duty court. There was a court where the judge took up defaults and summary judgments and, and all kinds of matters that weren't trials. And so there was a box by the copier. And my job every day was to go to the box, pick up all the files, and go to duty court and handle all those cases. Uh, in addition, I wanted to be a tax lawyer. I thought at that time I, that time I was going to be a tax lawyer, so I started doing tax work, and I quickly discovered that, that I didn't particularly enjoy tax, and tax didn't particularly enjoy me. In the meantime, I had started teaching at the law school, and I was teaching a course called Security Devices, which is banking and finance. So all the work in the firm where, that involved banking and finance and mortgage lending research kind of came to me because I was teaching the course. And uh, from that, uh, it developed that that work started flowing to me. And when the Resolution Trust Company came in, when the savings and loan crisis occurred in the 80s, there was a problem where a, lumber, a number of savings and loans were taken over, and Resolution Trust came in. And they needed people to go into the uh, savings and loans and analyze their books and determine which loans were good and which loans were bad and how to deal with them. And so I was hired to help do that and from that I got into litigation over that and from that I got into appellate work so that's why I kind of backed into my career as a, a commercial litigator and appellate lawyer. Well I had a senior partner who liked to come in at 630 and uh, I had a young child at the time and I couldn't leave the house that early uh, be there for 630 because I wanted to have breakfast with my daughter but he would leave a note on my desk 630 a.m. Mike where were you? 6.35, need to see you. So I started waking up at the morning feeding at 4.30. And I would go in, uh, work for a couple of hours, go back, have breakfast with my wife and my daughter, and then come back to the office. But to stop the notes, I would start leaving notes at 4.30, and 4.30 a.m., need to talk to you, 4.45 a.m., need to chat with you. So the 6.30 notes stopped. I was in the practice of law at Sanders Downing. I really loved it. I loved my partners. I loved the practice. But there was a bank in town that got, became convinced that, uh, that I was the lawyer that the bank wanted. It was a major bank. And they said, if you want to start a firm, we'll give you all the business. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm 33. I can do that. So with uh, a number of other people, we formed a firm called Steen, Reuben, Curry, Colvin, and Joseph. And Rick Curry and Mary Joseph and I are still partners here at McGlinchey Stafford. Uh, and we started the firm on February 14th of 1983 and we mortgaged our homes and borrowed money and set up at the bank and only to find by March 15th, the Ides of March, that the people who had hired us got fired. So we sat down and we said, can we make this thing work? And it turns out that Although the people who hired us got fired, the board of the bank uh, didn't uh, 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 fire us. So we still kept a portion of the business and we were very successful. And we grew that firm from 
six people uh, to 21, and we merged with the McGlinchey Law Firm in 1993. Being involved with bar associations, I think, is critical for lawyers. And I've been involved in the Baton Rouge Bar Association, was president of that, had a number of offices in the Louisiana State Bar, was president of that. Been a number of national groups like the American College of Real Estate Lawyers and the Uniform Law Commission and American Law Institute. And I think being involved in bar associations and national organizations like that are, are important for three reasons. Number one is I think we all as lawyers have an obligation to give back. We are fortunate enough to be in a profession where we have the ability to sue people, help them, solve problems go to court, use the legal system to help solve issues. We have an obligation, I think, to give back. And part of that give back is to involve with bar associations that are involved in that give back process and support. Number two, we all tend to get confined to our little areas of practice. Whatever those practice areas are, we know lots of lawyers in that area. But we don't know many lawyers outside of that area. And bar associations help expand both our knowledge base and our friendships by introducing us to lawyers who practice in the fields that we would never have interacted with and meet people that we would never have known. And number three, there is a camaraderie that develops. Uh, and uh, some of my, my best friends and my wife's best friends, we have met through bar association activities. People who, we, who would we have never run into but for that. I do 10 to 20 public speeches a year still. Uh, and I do them on US, Canada, the UK. Uh, do them on a variety of topics. I talk to bar groups and bar associations and civic groups and Fortune 500 companies. And uh, I enjoy it and I think I'm invited back because I combine a, a unique multimedia presentation. When I talk, there's something on the screen, but nothing's on the screen more than three to five seconds. When, whatever's happening is timed and I'm con controlling it from my computer. So it's kind of like animation and it emphasizes what I say. And if I change something, I can change it on the fly. Number two, it's humorous. I try to, to, to create humor. And number three, uh, I produce a paper for each one, which is a serious paper. But the purpose of a talk, I think, uh, particularly a public presentation like that, an hour CLE or an hour presentation or a 20 minute luncheon presentation is not to impart knowledge. I don't think you can teach in an hour. You can teach in a semester, but you can't teach in an hour. What you can do is raise consciousness of people in a way that, that, that makes them aware of something they hadn't thought of previously. So I want to both entertain, which is to keep their attention and not have them looking at their iPhones. And number two, I want them to walk away with at least one aha moment uh, in every talk. So what I want everybody to walk away with is, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I need to learn more. Or, oh, I didn't know about that. I can fix a problem that I've got. Or, oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, I'll, I've got a case on that. I need to l learn about it further. So what I try to do is to, is to create those kind of moments, not teaching them what to do, but giving them the idea that they need to learn more about it and then they can go to the paper to learn. I usually end my presentations by sitting down at the piano and singing a song that I have composed for the group and for that specific occasion. It's always a shock. It's kind of like you know, monkeys typing Shakespeare that a lawyer can play piano. So typically the piano is hidden uh, under a, a black cover uh, and it, most people don't notice it in the room. And when I get to the end of my talk, I do say there is one question I haven't answered, which is has there been a song written that recaps all the points of this talk? And is there a song written that uses a demonstrative piece of evidence. And then I walk over, whip off the cover, there's the demonstrative evidence, which is the piano, and then I sing the song. It always kind of gets a gasp, and then usually applause, and uh, about half the time a standing ovation. I've written both fiction and nonfiction, lots of law books and lots of legal, legal articles, probably 50 or so. Um, and I like writing nonfiction. I like writing about the law because I think it helps to explain an area of the law in clear terms, particularly with examples. I always like to give examples or hypothets in my papers so that readers can understand not merely what the rule is, but how the rule applies in different uh, facets. And I, I, I like to use lots of footnotes because I don't like the text to be interrupted by citations or string uh, rulings or, or lines of cases. And I don't like to use 
block quotes because I've always found as a student, if there was a block quote, an indented quote in a, in a paper or a law review article or a, or a case, I figured I'll come back and read that later and I never did. So I try to put all the block quotes in footnotes, paraphrase so that it reads easily. Uh, fiction I love because I get to write with my wife. My wife and I have written two books. One's called The Cotton Crest Curse. One's called Cashed Out. Cotton Crest Curse is a historical thriller. It won a national award as the Indie Fab Book of the Year as the best thriller and suspense novel. It was announced at the American Library Association and meeting in San Francisco. It's been translated into German. It's gotten a lot of awards. And uh, Cashed Out is a noir book, uh, contemporary legal thriller been compared to John Grisham and Michael Conley, and uh, it won a national award, the Jack Eden Award, and it's also uh, was shortlisted for the Silver Falchion Award. And I love writing fiction because my wife and I get to do that together, but also there are no footnotes. It's, it's wonderful because you get to create a world, and our goal when we write fiction is to first have a serious theme, but written in an entertaining style in a page-turning thriller, because you can put down a book at any point, question is how do you get the, the reader to say, all right, I'll just turn the page, I'll read one more chapter to see what happens next. And that's what we try to do. We try to rate books so that people say, all right, I'll just read one more chapter to see what happens next, and then they stay up all night and read the book. But the, the two people who come to mind the most are my father, who was a fantastic lawyer and a great judge. Uh, whose opinions, uh, he died in 1991, his opinions are still being quoted today. And uh, he, was a, he, he wrote wonderfully and very incisively and had a great heart and great empathy, but all within the strictures of the law. And the other was my grandfather, who was a lawyer in Alexandria and who had the courage to stand up for his political beliefs even though it cost him his seat in the House of Representatives. He was involved uh, in the impeachment of Huey Long, and that cost him his seat. What accomplishments am I most proud of? It's being a husband, and a father, and a grandfather. You know, things that happen in, in your career, in your legal career, your teaching career, your music career, they're fine. But the most important thing is family.